How to develop a Zelda-like with 3JS. You're on the Night Coder channel, and in this second part, we're going to tackle the physics engine, and always in pure JavaScript. Let's go. In the first part, we looked at how to prepare a scene using 3JS. We coded a script to load the game's assets from Blender, and we created a player instance and a level instance, but we only took care of the graphics. In this video, we'll be working on the physics engine with Rapier. Finally, we'll start integrating a gamepad to interact with the game. Let's get coding. We have a scene containing an instance for the level, an instance for the player, and an instance for the lighting. When the level is instantiated, it displays visual elements, but it has no physics. It's the same for the player. It contains a graphic asset, a mesh, but it has no physics. For game physics, we'll be using Rapier, the most powerful JS physics engine. As with the graphics engine, I create a new file dedicated to the physics engine. I import Rapier. We start by initializing the lib. I find it ugly. I don't know why they've organized their engine like this. We instantiate the physical universe by indicating the forces present. Here, we simply have gravity. This is the universe in which we'll simulate the game's physical behavior. I import the physics engine and add it to the game's loop. For each frame, we call the step function. This allows all future physical entities to evolve. As a reminder, in Blender, I've named the meshes according to their type visual meshes of the level, meshes that will be used as colliders, character and mob meshes. We've already retrieved and sorted all the meshes from word0.gb. All I have to do is pass the colliders to the constructor instance, and we'll also need the physics engine. During instantiation, we initialize the game's physics. All we need are the level colliders and the physics engine. So how are we going to code all this? We have our physical universe, and within it, we can declare two types of physical entities, dynamic rigid body and static rigid body. The dynamic rigid body contains a geometric shape, and it is affected by external forces and contacts. A linear velocity can be added, angular velocity, a linear force and an angular force. Above all, it can collide with another rigid body. And for rigid body fixed, it also contains geometry. It can't move, but it can block dynamic rigid bodies. Its role is to act as an obstacle. We're going to use it for all the elements in the level. The geometric shapes of rigid bodies are called colliders. Rapier lets you create standard geometries or generate them from 3D meshes. You can specify the friction level and density, and Rapier calculates the geometry's mass and center of mass, but it can also be set manually. We're going to create colliders and rigid bodies for the game's level. I'm installing a rigid body fixed. You start by describing the instance. Then you instantiate using this description. For each collider mesh, we'll create a rigid body. To create the colliders, we retrieve the 3JS geometry. We make a copy of its points and a copy of the ordering of its points. This information is used to draw polygons and geometry in space. From this, we can create a collider description. Finally, we declare a new collider with its rigid body to the physics engine. It's far too wordy. Basically, we just want to create collision geometries. This is code that has nothing to do with the level's behavior. I'll create a file to externalize this part. With this file, we'll remove all procedural scripts from the game entities. I paste the script. Of course, don't forget the dependencies the function will use. Now we have a function to create rigid body fixed from 3D geometry. Again, I find this too wordy, so I'll factor it out. I extract the collider creation script. This is actually a different step. At this step, we're able to generate rigid body fixed for our level. I'll use this new function. Now the instance is able to generate the level visual and the level physics. And we still have a minimalist code. Onto the player, we need the physics engine. And this time, we're going to create a rigid body dynamic. I'm going to do the same thing I did for the level. I'm going to create a function that will generate the physics of the game's dynamic entities. Unlike the level, I need to keep a reference to the physical instance, as we'll be interacting with it. We'll need to know the collider's original position. 
I store the references of the physical instances. Don't forget to declare the class properties. It's not compulsory, but it's a practical convention. I import the function I haven't yet created. I return to the functions file and add the creation of rigid body dynamic. It's the same code. I specify the rigid body's original position. Small typing error. It happens even to the best. For the collider, I will create a sphere with a radius of 0.25. In the same way, I will factor the creation of the collider into another function. The collider is described and instantiated. I save. It's okay for physics, but nothing happens. Yet we have a character with dynamic physics who is subject to gravity. What you need to understand is that the physical engine does its own thing. It evolves over time. And the same goes for the graphics engine. So we need to retrieve information from the physical elements and to update the corresponding visual elements. At least if you want to see what's going on visually. To do this, we're going to add a major new function for game entities, the update function. At each frame, we'll update the physics, then update the visuals. As for the physics, we don't have to code anything yet, as we're not yet interacting. For the visuals, however, we'll simply copy the rigid body's position. On the main script side, don't forget to call the instance update at each frame. That's it, the character falls to the ground. Just to test the player class, I clone several player meshes in the 3D game file. For each player mesh, I create a player instance. I add all instances to the scene and I update each instance every frame. It works. Each entity makes its own life. They are subject to gravity and are blocked by the rigid body of the ground. I'll delete it quickly. It's just for the demo. Now let's get on with the controller. Currently, the graphics section is influenced by the game's physics section. Now, we want the physics section to be influenced by the controller. To begin with, we create a new file dedicated to controllers. We're going to use the gamepad JavaScript API. I'll start by creating constants to retrieve information from the gamepad. This class will serve as our interface with the gamepad API. Why do this? If we want to migrate to another input system, we don't want to affect the game code. I'm going to use getters to simulate the control properties that the game will use. A getter to retrieve the game page connected to the PC. A getter for x-axis displacement intensity. If no gamepad, I apply a default value. Otherwise, I retrieve the x-axis value from the gamepad. I do the same for the z-axis. I create an attack property. The default is false. Otherwise, I retrieve the state of a joystick button. Same for other properties. If you wish, you can use a combination of buttons to simulate the state of a property. For example, pressing A and B activates the side attack property. You can create as many virtual buttons as you like. Most importantly, this component abstracts all the input logic. In other words, it simplifies the game code. I'll add it to the player file. We'll simply instantiate the gamepad as a property of the player class. At each frame, we'll read the state of the control properties and modify the physical behavior of the instance. The X and Z properties can vary from one to one. I multiply by a speed constant. I obtain two linear velocities that I'll apply to the instance's rigid body. For the vertical speed, I'll simply retrieve the current speed. I let the physics engine decide according to context. Finally, I apply the velocities to the player's rigid body. The boolean is to force the rigid body to be set immediately. I take the controller and it works. We can move the mesh instance with the joystick. The tree collider blocks our move. That's okay. However, there's a glitch in the movement. If I release the joystick, the character continues to drift. There's a drift. The X, Z properties of the joystick don't exactly return to zero. I'll fix this bug. I create a function that will round a floating number to zero if it falls below a certain threshold. By default, I've set the threshold to 0.2. I import the function into the gamepad file and apply it to the X and Z properties. I save and it's fixed. No more drift and movement remains analog. My controller is very common and I don't know if this is a common bug. Now let's deal with a very important component, the camera. In a Zelda-like, the camera must follow the player. As with the other instances, I'm adding 
an update function. At each frame, we'll copy the player's position. And don't forget to call the update function in the main loop, otherwise it won't work. I save. The camera is inside the player. That's not what we want. We copy the player's position, then add a height and depth offset. And it's okay. We're starting to get a feel for the gameplay. There's still one flaw. The light doesn't follow the player. I use a light point, so I have to follow the player. But even if I use the light direction, I'd still be obliged to follow the movement because shadow projection is based on the projection of a texture. The texture must remain within the perimeter of the camera. Same process as the camera. With each frame updating the light, I copy the player's position directly. No need for offset. The point light already has an offset position in the light instance. And that's it. The game is clean. The player moves through the level but can't cross colliders. The camera follows the player. The light remains consistent. At this step of the tutorial, the main code is still simple. Entities are instantiated. And at each frame, they follow a given behavior. In the next video, we'll see how to use a real 3D character with animations. We'll see how to import it with its animations from Blender into the application and to bring the character instance to life. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in comments and I'll take the time to answer. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss the rest. That was Nightcoder. See you next time. Bye.